Uh, welcome in, everybody. Happy Thursday here. Thursday, February 29th, 2024. And South Carolina has officially found their new wide receiver coach. We said that about a month ago, but this time, knock on wood, this will be the last time we talk about South Carolina hiring a new wide receiver coach for the foreseeable future. As Limestone head coach, Mike Furry, has been named head coach, or excuse me, wide receiver coach of the Gamecocks, comes over after two years of being a head coach at Limestone. Has more experience of being at Limestone, but before before that, before the last two years, he was coaching the Chicago Bears as a wide receiver coach. So you do get a guy that comes from the Division II ranks, has plenty of experience when it comes to recruiting, hopped around a little bit between Marshall as an assistant coach, was at Limestone for two years from 2016 to 17. Went to the Chicago Bears in 2018, was there from 18 to 2021. He did not overlap with offensive coordinator Dow Loggins. I know some people have asked that on Gamecock Central. I've seen that on social media as well. So some of you who did your research on that, you're aware of that, but some of you might not have been caught up on uh, on that side of it. So yes, did coach the Bears, but no, unfortunately, no crossover. With Dal Loggins. I'll share my overall thoughts about this hire in just a little bit. Let me know what you guys think as the Gamecocks have made their 10th, 10th coaching change this offseason. When I say coaching change, I'm talking about hirings, firings, coaches moving from one position to another, coaches leaving South Carolina for other positions, whether it be James Coley, whether it be Jody Wright. Whether it be Pete Lumbo, of course, two of those coaches, Lumbo and Wright, leaving here to become head coaches at other colleges. Let us know what you think. And South Carolina makes another change. And all these changes go back. I said this offseason it goes back actually to January 3rd with Monterio Hardesty being fired earlier this offseason. Of course, Justin Stepp moved over from coaching wide receivers to coaching tight ends. That didn't last too long as he left for Illinois a couple weeks back. And then, of course, James Coley lasted a, what, just a just over a whopping month at South Carolina before last week it was announced that he would be leaving for Georgia. So before we get into the, the overall hiring, a couple things that stood out to me about the contract of it all. And when I looked at this contract for Mike Furry, the first thing, and I posted this on social media, I included this today on Quick Slants on Gamecock Central. If you're not a subscriber, sign up today for just $1 for your first month on GC. Get everything from football standpoint, but basketball as well. Of course, the men and women's basketball program is getting ready for March Madness. The men, big win last night. Women team remain unbeaten. And then baseball, big weekend for the Gamecocks as they take on Clemson starting up tomorrow here in Columbia and then over at Segra Park on Saturday and then in Clemson on Sunday. But the thing that stands out to me the most is just how they've changed just a little bit language-wise. Just added another little caveat in there with Mike Furry's contract. If Furry leaves within the first 120 days, okay, that puts us at this date right now, February 29th, all the way up until June 30th. If he were to leave, he would have to pay the school $850,000. Now, why is that of note? Why are we talking about the outs of contracts? Does this mean he's leaving? No, no, no. But it shows that South Carolina... They learned their lesson with this James Coley situation. And I know we could go back. We could go back to the Mike Bobo exit. We could go back to the Will Friend exit. And those are just a couple that come to mind, at least during the Shane Beamer era. Obviously, if you want to go back even further than that, there's been other cases, other coaches during their careers, if you want to call it that, careers at South Carolina who really weren't here that long. But when you look at those three, especially the James Coley situation, 
Coley, when he left South Carolina, and South Carolina made sure that he paid up for it, he owed the school $450,000. In this case, with Mike Furry, Furry's getting paid even less. I think just under, what, 425000 is how much he's going to be making this year at South Carolina. But the buyout, if he were to leave, like I said, those first 120 days, he would owe the school $850,000. So good on South Carolina for adding that in there. I mean, you, you got to cover your bases, right? Hopefully we don't see a situation like this anytime soon. I don't want to say, you know, ever again. I mean, it's college football. Things change. But. I like the idea that South Carolina was able to add that part into the contract. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some people out there saying, well, why didn't they do that with James Coley? It's a fair question. You obviously don't envision a coach being here for just the month before jumping ship to go coach the same position in the same conference at a school a state over from you. But that's what happened to South Carolina. So they learned their lesson. And hopefully moving forward, as much as, again, you hope that you're not in a situation like this anytime soon. But you hope that this is something that could be written into a lot of these contracts to protect South Carolina if, God forbid, they were ever in a situation like this again. Now, obviously, it comes down to both sides agreeing to the terms, and a lot of these coaches have agents. And they have to be on the same page, but at the same time, too, I mean, how many coaches are going to sign a deal thinking that they're going to be leaving within the first couple months? Right. I mean, the first four months for crying out loud. So keep it going. Keep it going. After the 120 days, if Furry were to leave for the remainder of the calendar year, so from July 1st to December 31st, 2024, it drops down to 350000 for the buyout. So again, that's not to alarm anyone. But that was one thing in particular that really stood out to me today when I was looking over for his contract is because that was something that was different for James Coley. So, like I said, South Carolina, they learned their lesson. They get they get $450,000 out of it because of Coley leaving. But obviously it created a lot of headaches to say the least. And South Carolina has gone through three different wide receiver coaches now in the last, what, two months, for crying out loud. Having said all that, get into my thoughts, but I you know you guys, some of you guys have thoughts on it as well. K Mean says, we'll miss him at Limestone. If he had to leave, I'm glad it was for Carolina. Zachary Barker. Says, looking at his resume, NFL experience and head coaching experience, and I heard he was very energetic. That's one thing that we keep hearing from people. And K-Means, if you're still there, sounds like you've been following him over at Limestone. Let us know what you think about what Coach Fury was able to bring to the program. Big Red says, wasn't our new wide receiver coach a former head coach? Seems to be the trend. If so, yes. New wide receiver coach comes on over from Limestone, Big Red. Spent the last two years there as head coach of Limestone. Did a phenomenal job the last two years. He was also the head coach of Limestone before he decided to go coach the Chicago Bears for a couple of years. So 2016 and 17, head coach at Limestone. Came back again in 2022 and 2023. The last two years as head coach at Limestone. Finished tied for first in the conference. And 
they were able to go play in the playoffs the last two years. And I can tell you, being a D2 guy, when you think of limestone football, at least for a period of time, they were really an afterthought for, for, for a long time. So what he was able to do at limestone was tremendous. But I think the other thing, too, is we talk about this a lot with a lot of coaches when they come in here. What can they do from a recruiting standpoint? The lack of resources you have at the Division II ranks, but especially at a school like Limestone, and that's not to badmouth the program by any means because, again, they've been really good in a lot of sports. I mean, lacrosse, for crying out loud, they were powerhouse. I haven't really been paying attention to them over the last couple of years. But, I mean, they were going to the national championship, it, fe- it seemed like, every other year. So they've produced some some talented sports programs, not just football. But, I mean, that's it's difficult. It's difficult to be able to recruit at a high level like that. So to be able to bring in the talent that Limestone was bringing in the last couple of years, it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes for what Coach Furry was able to do. And obviously he assembled a phenomenal coaching staff and some of the people that he was able to bring in there. But I bring these things up because, and I wrote a little bit about it today over on Gamecock Central, quick slants. When you look at this coaching staff, when you look at this coaching staff and what South Carolina has done outside of Sean Elliott, every assistant coach on staff, every assistant coach, I'm not talking about analysts, even though there are analysts like Greg Atkins, but every assistant coach on staff outside of Sean Elliott has either coached or played in the NFL. Let me say that again. With the hiring of Furry, every assistant coach for the Gamecocks, except for Sean Elliott, has either coached or played in the NFL. And I've said this before in the past. There's only so much you can do in an era where money is really becoming more and more important when it comes from a recruiting standpoint. Obviously, you'd have to be naive not to believe that money, different exchanges through the back door. I mean, those things have took place for years, well before NIL, well before it was legal. But at the same time, too, how can you... How can you compete against some of these other programs when you can only control so much from an NIL standpoint? And I've said this before, I think the best way to do it, and it's obviously, it doesn't mean it's a foolproof plan, but again, controlling what you can is really being able to sell the vision of playing at the next level. Selling the development part of it. And while South Carolina certainly is not the only program in the country that has a long list of coaches on the staff that have ties to the NFL, whether it be former players, whether it be guys that have coached at the, at the next level, but being able to have so many of those guys across the board when you look at it, right? It's a tremendous way to be able to sell that pipe dream, that pipeline, that dream of being able to play at the next level. I've talked to some of the former players. I've talked to some of the current players. I've talked to former players in the past, though, that have played with this program, and they've talked about that, especially over the last couple of years during the Shane Beamer era. Some of these guys, of course, were recruited by Will Muschamp, but some of these guys have come in recruited by Shane. But even talking to the current players, having a chance to run into guys like Kai Kroger the other night, there was an event right down the street, Clyde Wren does a phenomenal job of being able to raise money each year for a tremendous cause that is near and dear to their family. And there's a lot of current players there. And just talking to some of them about guys even like Joe D. Camillus and what they're bringing to the table already and how, and how smooth that transition's been, but how guys are quickly bought into it. And we talk about replacing a guy like Pete Lumbo. That's not going to be easy by any means. And obviously, we're in the honeymoon phase 
for a guy like Joe D. Camillus, but I think things are going to be just fine with, with Joe D. But just hearing players talk about that and hearing players say, you know, this guy, this guy gets it. Not just from a, okay, we want to be better today standpoint to help the program, but being able to help them in their dreams of being able to play at the next level. So I bring that up because you get, you bring a guy in like Mike Furry. He has not only coached in the NFL, but for any of you who've paid attention to his story, and maybe you've gotten familiar, more familiar over the last couple of days, but for some of you that aren't as familiar, he's a guy that played nearly a decade in the NFL. He did phenomenal things on both sides of the football. I mean, there was one season that he had four interceptions, and then I don't know if it was the the next year right after that, he led the NFC with 98 receptions in 2006. I don't know if it was right after that or not, but he had 98 receptions, led the NFC one year with the Lions. Phenomenal story in the sense that he is someone that epitomizes the underdog. And when you look at what he was able to do, especially during that season in 2006 with the Lions, but in a lot of his time in the NFL, especially with Detroit, what really stands out is just how fundamentally sound the guy was because he wasn't the biggest, he wasn't the fastest, he wasn't the strongest. He really relied on two things. One, working hard, but two, understanding what the hell he was doing. Just being, from a fundamental standpoint, technically sound. So when we look at what South Carolina has right now in that wide receiver room, there's a lot of young talent in there. A lot of young talent. They brought three players in from the transfer portal. They have a lot of young receivers, though, either the ones that were already coming in with this pat with this uh past high school recruiting class or the guys that were freshmen last year even like a guy like Nick Nicholas Harbor for crying out loud he's your most productive wide receiver from a year ago him and Luke Doty as far as returning receivers to the Gamecocks so you have a new wide receiver coach that comes in, and in a lot of ways, you have the ability to put your stamp on this room because of how young it really is. Yes, you're bringing in three transfers. I get that. Jared Brown, Gage Loverdale. We can keep going down the list. But the majority of this room, the majority of this room are young players. Now, I'm going to bring up the screen. We've shared this a couple times this offseason. But this is scholarship players as far as what South Carolina has from a scholarship standpoint with wide receivers. And when you look at it, when you look at what South Carolina has, I mean, that is a young, young wide receiver room. Very young. So... What he's able to do, obviously, we know how talented Nicholas Harbor Harbor is. And I still think there's a lot of growth that he can still go through. I think he did some good things last year. But as far as being that wide receiver that he wants to be, and I'm sure this fan base would love to see right away, he still has a ways to go. But then you look at some of the other young wide receivers that they have. I mean, Tyson Russell. I loved what he was able to do this past season. I really did in the limited time that we saw him. I think that's a player to really keep an eye on this year. Again, new additions via the portal. Makes the room a little bit more crowded on the front end. But I still think a guy like Russell can have an impact on this team this upcoming year. And then you get to the freshman who redshirted. So the redshirted freshman. Elijah Codwell, who I know a lot of people, especially from Rock Hill, would love to see healthy, first and foremost, but be able to 
grow tremendously this year because we really didn't get to see him last year because of that early season injury. But I think he's a player to keep an eye on. Obviously, keep going down the list. Kelton Henderson, C.J. Adams. Never mind the true freshmen that are here. Maisie O'Bennett and Gatling. But he, he's going to have an opportunity to really be able to put a stamp, his stamp on this room. I really like what he's going to be able to to have in front of him from a talent standpoint. Now, what South Carolina does, we're going to have to wait and see. But being able to get this hire done as quickly as it was, I mean, that to me was the most important thing. We're sitting here today as we do this show on February 29th. We have less than three weeks to go until spring football starts up. And as I've talked about it before, whether or not Sellers is the guy, which a lot of us assume that he will be. Whether or not Sellers is the guy, you have to be able to have a wide receiver room that can create separation for that young man. The offensive line room looks a hell of a lot deeper this year, especially from an experience standpoint. Running back room, we understand what's in that room from a talent standpoint. But a lot of it's going to come down to what can you get from a production standpoint at wide receiver? Especially when you have a new quarterback this year. Being able to get a wide receiver coach in there as quickly as possible was going to be not just needed, but a must, in my opinion. Because you need to be able to get him caught up to speed on what you're trying to do so that these wide receivers, they can be able to create separation so they can help out that young quarterback. Because if not, you want to talk about wasting 15 practices in the spring, 14 including the spring game. So 14 practices in a spring game, I don't know how much you would have really been able to get out of it if this hire took another week or so. But that wasn't the case. South Carolina was able to get this thing done quickly. There were reports going back to Monday that Beamer had pretty much made up his mind at that point. And we mentioned some names over on Gamecock Central, my colleagues, Wes, Chris, myself, names to keep an eye on as far as names that would make sense. Not a deep, deep dive. Not just throwing names out for the sake of throwing names out. But this was a higher the more you talk to people close to the program that just made sense for Shane. Reading some more comments here before we get back on over. To my thoughts, quick slants today. Tommy, good to have you on. Says, good choice, someone with credibility and character. Leak Toe says, son plays for him at Limestone. Outstanding man and family. Keep hearing a lot about that. K Means, he was my son's coach at Limestone. Unbelievable football knowledge and energy. He can really develop players. Just a great man all around. If you're one of these players today, I mean, we, we mentioned it on Tuesday. The Mazio Bennett's of the world. Going back to last week, some of the comments that we saw, at least on social media from players, like kind of like, you know, like, what the hell? I think intern Joe said it best on Tuesday. In a lot of ways, these players, it's like they're like orphans for crying out loud because of the number of coaches that have gone through there, right? This is the third wide receiver coach that has been here in the last two months. So for those wide receivers, especially the ones who decided to come here via the transfer portal or the Mazio Bennett's of the world, the Gatlin's of the world, guys who were recruited out of high school and enrolled early. It's been a it's been a whirlwind for them with everything that's gone on. And you're just trying to figure out, all right, who the hell am I playing for? So again, three weeks away, less than three weeks away until spring football practices start up, you're able to at least get some type of relationship built between now and then tomorrow march 1st on friday mike furry will be officially introduced 
as South Carolina's newest wide receiver coach. Press conference is set to begin at 11. We will have coverage for you on Gamecock Central. Typically, those press conferences ear live. So we will have a link for you available as well over on Gamecock Central, if that is indeed the case, which I expect it to be at this point. I think all of us, not just reporters, but you guys out there as well. You guys have all become pros as far as how South Carolina handles these things because, like we mentioned, between hirings and firings, coaches sliding from one position to another, coaches leaving for other jobs, this is the 10th, the 10th change to this coaching staff since January 3rd. 10th. It's been a lot of changes. And the crazy thing is, if you think back to before that, I know that there was a portion, and I'm sure there still is, maybe for other positions. There was a portion of this fan base that wanted to see changes that didn't take place this offseason with this coaching staff. Can you imagine how many more changes that would have been? I mean, my goodness. So... That's where we are, though. That's where we are today. South Carolina, 10 different coaching changes to their staff. And that's not even including the changes that take place with analysts or coaches who are a part of uh, the program as grad assistants. A lot of tweaks. A lot of tweaks to the coaching staff this offseason. And again, a lot of changes going back to just January 3rd for crying out loud. Big Red. Every coach either coached or played in the NFL and or as head coaching experience before coming to Columbia, winning formula for the program. I do like the head coaching experience element of it, Big Red. There's no question, especially this fan base, there's no question that Sean Elliott's going to be able to help out Shane in a lot of ways. Obviously, with the time that he spent as a head coach at Georgia State, but even being in that chair as head coach, interim head coach for the Gamecocks back in 2015 for half a season when Steve Spurrier decided to call it quits and he had to fill in. He understands what it's like to be in that chair. Mike Furry, okay, Division Two, but you know what? He understands what it's like to be in that chair, too, as a head coach. And I wrote about this today, too, on Gamecock Central. If you've been paying attention to college football as a whole, and I know there's some people that get so caught up in the SEC bubble, they got the blinders on, and they don't pay attention to anything else. But if you look at what's took place over the last couple of years, and really you can go back probably another 15 years before that, there's been a lot of examples of, and I think we talked about this a little bit on Tuesday. There's been a lot of examples of Division II coaches who have come up through the ranks and have had a lot of success coaching at a higher level, whether it be FCS, whether it be FBS. Uh, Brian Kelly, for example. And a lot of these coaches' names that I'm going to mention, these are guys that went from being a head coach to a head coach, which obviously that's not the case here with Mike Furry. Furry doesn't have to worry about an entire program. He just has to worry about coaching one position. One position. All he has to worry about is coaching wide receivers. But Brian Kelly, the dominance that he had at Grand Valley State Division II program, works his way up since moving on up. Two-time coach of the year at the FBS ranks. Uh, Kirk Signetti. Used to coach over at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Division II program. Eventually turned James Madison into a powerhouse. Now he's taking over at Indiana. I've mentioned Bob Chesney. Goes from Assumption, goes to Holy Cross, wins five straight Patriot League titles. Now he's taking over James Madison, a program that was ranked in the top 25 last year. So again, these are... Examples more so of coaches that have gone as head coach to head coach, but it just goes to show that there's been a list, and these are just a couple names of coaches going from the D2 ranks, working their way up and having success. Now, if you really want to go back further, 
there's even more. And we're not even talking about from a, an assistant standpoint, right? Going from head coach to an assistant coach. Some even on the Division three ranks. Go look at Pete Lembo. But going back to Big Red's point of head coaching experience, I mean, my goodness, you bring in extra head coaches after losing a guy like Pete Lembo, especially some of these smaller schools. We want to talk about being able to identify players. Hey, is this guy someone that could play at this level? And I mentioned that a couple times. And I know some of them, not they're not here anymore. But I thought about a guy like Mario Anderson. I thought about a guy like Nate Atkins. I think about some of these small school guys, Carlin Patel. I think about some of these small school guys who came up through the ranks and they did some really good things here at South Carolina. And that's not to say it was all Pete Lembo, because it certainly wasn't just Pete, but being able to have someone who coached at a smaller level to say, hey, you know what? I I know what Division Three talent looks like. I know what FCS talent looks like. This guy, he can play at this level. So now you have an extra set of eyes with someone like Furry, and on top of that, Sean Elliott as well. So I think being able to bring those two guys in, especially at a time right now, especially right now after losing Pete Lembo, I think is going to be very valuable to this program. No question about it. Martin says it's been a crazy off season. No question about it, Martin. No question about it. Kelly says that's how you bring in the top staff to get the top players to make the top teams year after year. I have been very impressed with what South Carolina has done. Despite, I mean, some of these changes, of course, they were either inevitable or they were done because they needed to make a change, right? Like you look at the, the move with Monterio Hardesty, a running back. Pete Lumbo, as we've talked about before, that was inevitable. At some point, Pete was going to leave here. When Pete was hired here, there was talks of, okay, how long was Pete going to stay here? Simply because he still had that itch to be a head coach again. But he truly loved the area. His wife is from the New England area. He's obviously from New York. Made sense. Made sense why they made the move when they did. Marion R26 says, Megatron played with Furry, so Megatron will probably swing by to talk to Harbor and tell him you can... Be like I was. And the other thing, too, talk about Megatron. Obviously, Megatron has a tremendous, tremendous relationship. Tremendous relationship. Um, I'll try to make sure I have the uh, name right. This is what happens when you have about eight different coaching changes this offseason. But Megatron, he um he has a he has a relationship already with one of the coaches on staff. And this is what happens when you blank. But the point being is you have another person there now. You have another person to be able to have them talk to them. So Big Red. Some people see the label transferred and automatically assume we don't have great players at the position. 
They are a buffer until our young guys get their feet under them. We'll be fine. I mean, it's part of college football, college sports really as a whole. It's tough to compare the sports when you look at basketball to football, right? But, I mean, look at what South Carolina has done from a basketball standpoint through the transfer portal. But from a football standpoint, there's going to be tremendous opportunity in a lot of positions, certainly at the wide receiver position. No question about it. Martin says the player I'm pulling for to improve and prove people wrong is Sidney Fugar. He got too much hate last season for just playing a game. Offensive line, and I mentioned this before, very deep. Very deep. I'll slide that down so that people can see the offensive line room. You look at the interior offensive line, offensive tackle positions. But what South Carolina has in that room in comparison to a year ago, much deeper from an experience standpoint. Much deeper. Robert Short says, I just hope that Furry can develop the talent. I get we need some in there. Quick, need to get someone in there. No question about it. Nick Babb says it seems like Beamer has done a complete overhaul of the offensive staff since the Clemson game. And that's the other thing, too. And it wasn't exactly right from point A to point B, just a direct line, a straight line. But I think there were a good amount of people that wanted to see changes to this coaching staff in some shape, way, or form. I think there were some people that wanted to see some changes from a defensive standpoint. I said this before that when you have it was not about the injuries. We just didn't have the bodies. You didn't have the people. You didn't have the talent. Players just weren't getting the freaking job done last year in a lot of ways. And I know it's easy just to be like, well, at some point you got to blame the coaches. You could. But we also saw how South Carolina changed things up at the end of the year. And they were able to do some good things defensively. I mean, they should have won. I mean, they had an opportunity to win against Clemson from a defensive standpoint. Offensively, they weren't getting anything done. They weren't getting anything done, but the defense kept them in that game. Defense won them the Kentucky game. Defense did some really good things to close out the year. So even looking at the defense, outside of maybe cornerback, I'd say, South Carolina has really upgraded in a lot of ways at every position. Defensive tackle, edge, linebacker, safety that's already a deep room. Being able to bring in another Kilgore brother doesn't doesn't hurt. But cornerback really is the only position I'd say that South Carolina, and that's not to say that a guy like, you know, OD Fortune can't do some good things there, but you're losing a guy like Marcella Style. You're losing a lot of experience. Like that's like the one position that I felt like South Carolina from a defensive standpoint didn't add more experience to. And that's not to say that they're not confident in the abilities of the players that they, they have in that room, but just in comparison to what they were able to get and what they were able to do from a transfer portal standpoint at other positions this offseason. Matt Matthews says, Coach Furry is the best, very smart offensive mind. Coach, my son, turned the offense completely around. Craig was the one that called the Morphins the other day. There you go, Craig. Derek Moore was the one that we were looking for. Demo is actually the one that inducted Calvin Johnson. into the Hall of Fame. That's who Megatron reached out to. Uh, Chad mentioned, remember Kirby Smart? Coached at Valdosta State. So did Muschamp. Yep, another example. Another example. The thing is, when it comes to coaching, at the end of the day, the majority of these guys, I mean, they all come up from, from smaller schools. Um, obviously, there's outliers. There'll be some guys that are fortunate where they don't have to 
climb the ladder as much. They still have to work their way up from the bottom of the barrel, though, in some shape, way, or form. But being able to bring in some of these guys that have coached at, at smaller schools, they just developed um, a habit where they're used to not being handed anything because they don't have all the resources in the world. They have to find a way to make things happen. Now, certainly, as the years have gone on, especially I'd say over the last, shoot, 10, 12 years, 15 really, things have really changed with the evolution of huddle, which a lot of coaches and a lot of players use when it comes to, to recruiting. I mean, back in the day, you would have to, I mean, sit down and literally slice up everything that you'd want, you know, from a VHS standpoint. Okay, you got the DVD. That's great. Huddle now, it changes the game. You just send a link now to a coach, DM a coach, and they're able to get everything now. So it's, it, it makes the world smaller in that sense. And if you're a smaller school coach, it's huge, huge. Because you don't have, like I said, you don't have the same resources and you're still able to go out there and recruit on a national level despite the fact of not having all the resources that maybe a bigger school has, that a bigger school certainly has. So I think there's a lot of things that Furry's going to be able to bring here that he, it's just part of him. Um, and clearly this is a guy, even despite the fact of coaching in the NFL, right? Was coaching, he was a head coach at Limestone in 16 and 17, coached in the NFL. He went back. He went back. There's a lot of coaches that wouldn't do that for one reason or another. Call it pride. Call it whatever. He went back. And I think that speaks volumes about who this guy is. That he's not someone that is going to be too prideful. He's going to be a guy that's going to go in there and He's going to be able to make a difference. And, you know, he that's where he wanted to be. Big Red asks, are we done with coaching changes or should we expect more change in the foreseeable future? I keep knocking on wood, Big Red. I don't expect any changes. I don't expect any changes in the foreseeable future. Um, but again, knock on wood. You know, as we sit here today, February 29th, I mentioned this before. And someone asked when the spring game is. Spring practices begin on March 19th. The spring game will be played on April 20th. That's a Saturday. So, look, we're getting to a point now where you're trying to have some type of consistency and, continu and build that continuity with your staff because spring football is going to be here before you know it. and with South Carolina having spring practices a little bit later this year in comparison to years past. Once spring practices are done, I mean, you want to talk about how quick summer is going to fly by. Summer is going to fly by, fly by, just because of how late the spring game is this year in comparison to years past. So I say that to say you want to be able to feel good about the direction that you're heading in, not just from an offensive and defensive standpoint, but even breaking it down positionally. You want to feel good about what you're trying to do from a wide receiver standpoint. You're trying to feel good about what you're doing from a quarterback standpoint. And as I mentioned before, those two guys, right, those two positions, sellers and whoever the hell the wide receiver guys are, whoever it is, whoever those top six are, we could have we have an idea. We listed this on Gamecock Central before, but you want to make damn sure that those guys are on the same page to be able to help out your young quarterback. So being able to be able to get these guys in there as quickly as possible with your new co uh, wide receiver coach is going to be massive. Again, obviously not a perfect world by any means having to deal with some of the popsicle headaches that South Carolina has had to deal with over the last couple of weeks. But the bottom line is Coley left and South Carolina, they had to keep moving forward. 
and they were able to make this hire fairly quickly, fairly quickly. From talking to people, I know there's other reports out there. This seemed like it was all but a done deal at the beginning of the week. And it just came down to, you know, for he having to make a decision ultimately as, as to whether or not he wanted the spot. And as we all know, he did. He did make that decision. Martin says, we thought we were getting Coley and Step as wide receiving tight end coach, but ended up with two former head coaches. Yeah, look, I know, especially this part of the, the, the state, I know there's a lot of people that care about Justin Step. And from being able to being able to get to cover Coach Step, I mean, Justin is an awesome guy. Awesome guy. Um, at the end of the day, South Carolina wanted to make a change, though, in that wide receiver room. And, and as I said before, you talk to people close to the program, there was fear that Step would have left even after this year, that he's been thinking about leaving the last two years. So I get it that there's there's a portion of this fan base that looks at how things played out, and they say, man, we could have had Justin Step still. Man, the way they did, they treated Justin Step uh, because all the because they wanted James Coley. I get that. I understand that. I hear where you're coming from. But at the same time, too, this also, again, talking to people close to the program, it felt like this was a move not just to create a spark in that wide receiver room, but there was also fear that Step could leave. That Step could could leave after this year. So could have got step maybe one more year if things didn't play out the way that they did, Um, obviously, you know, with Coley. But at the same time, too, things happen the way they did. You get Sean Elliott back, which I know many Gamecock fans are very excited about. And on top of that, on top of that, you're able to get in a wide receiver coach who also has head coaching experience and also has NFL coaching experience. Chad says, Mike, do we have a GM for the football team like a lot of blue chip programs have? So Taylor Edwards for South Carolina, what his title is, the director of player personnel, that'd be the closest to it, I'd say, Chad. Um, But ultimately, Shane Beamer makes the final decisions if that makes sense. So you're not getting a a true general manager like you would have in the NFL or some of these other professional sports, but you have someone that is helping that part of it. And Taylor Edwards has been part of the program since 2021, February 2nd. So he's been here now for past couple of years. See, we'll ask Mike. Um, Mike was my head coach at Limestone University. I grew up a South Carolina fan. I can say with absolute certainty that Carolina got the best in the business on and off the field. Well, appreciate that, Will. Always good to hear from a fellow D2 guy. Craig mentions the part about with Chad, not by title, as we talked about Taylor Edwards. God Loves Comics says, so who's the top player at Limestone? I forgot heard of South Carolina through the portal. I'm sure that's exactly what Limestone fans want to hear. If I do remember correctly, if I do remember correctly, there were some players that South Carolina was recruiting, they were recruiting, that ended up going to Limestone. I remember DJ Black, who's a wide receiver, He was, yeah, DJ Black was a was a walk-on at South Carolina, and then he ended up going over there to, to Limestone. So he was a walk-on in 2022, and he's been at Limestone. Um, I'd have to go back. I'd have to go back and see. I really, I'd be lying to you if I said I've been paying attention to Limestone. Big red ass. Does having a new wide receivers coach and a young receiver actually benefit us as they don't have any habits that could be detrimental to the play calling? I don't know if it's as... So when you ask that question, this is what I think of in my head, Big Red. I've had conversations with former wrestlers 
if for any of for any, um WWC WCW fan going back to the Glazier days, Ray Lloyd. I've had this conversation with Ray. I've known Ray now for goodness about six, seven, eight years now. And Ray would tell me that when you have a lot of these young wrestlers, and they're running, I'll bring this back to football, but this makes me think about what you're saying, Big Red. When you have a lot of these wrestlers that want to get into the business, a lot of them, a lot of the coaches, they love when these when these wrestlers don't have a background in wrestling. Like they weren't coached up to be a, you know, a WWF wrestler, WWE, w, WCW. They like when they come in there and they're 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 raw because there's not bad habits that you have to break. So, you saying that, I don't know if it's as simple as that, but I do think there is something to be said that they don't have to sometimes when you have a, a wide receiver coach that comes in, they teach you not even just a wide receiver coach. It could be a quarterback coach. It could be a defensive back coach. It could be a linebacker coach, defensive line, whatever the case may be. But I think about the wide receiver position, there's certain tendencies and there's certain habits that certain coaches want their wide receivers to have and to be able to possess. And sometimes, I'm not saying it's necessarily a, a, a bad thing, but it could kind of create just more crap in, in a young wide receiver's head that they're thinking about and trying to process. And as we all know, the less you're thinking, the quicker you're able to play. So my whole point with what I'm trying to get at, Big Red, is it can't hurt. It can't hurt, right? I mean, James Coley didn't have an opportunity to go onto the field and work with these wide receivers in a manner in which they're getting coached up and there's little things that he was already teaching them just because of where they were and things were at, right? You know, from a from an off season standpoint, because Coley was here from middle of January until just a week ago, or around then. So I think that can help. I think that can help out a lot for sure, as far as there's not going to be as much clutter in the minds of some of these wide receivers, especially the younger ones. Craig asks, or mentions, wide receiver, Beans Hunt from North Augusta is going to Limestone. Well, pay attention to it. I'm not going to hold my breath that there's anyone necessarily from Limestone. That's no, and again, for those of you who do know me, you know that I'm always going to give love to D2 being a former D2 guy, but um, I'm not foreseeing any additions from Limestone. Could be. Could be. I mean, we haven't seen anything from Georgia State. But at the same time, too, where South Carolina is at right now from a scholarship standpoint, currently they're two over what they're projected to be for the fall. They're at 87 right now. And a reminder for those of you who don't pay attention to our shows as much, maybe it's the first time watching, or maybe you've seen a couple of our shows, but you didn't hear me say this before in the past. When we talk about the projected scholarship number, being 87, that takes into consideration the players who aren't currently at South Carolina, but will be in the fall. So a guy like Matthew Fuller, for example, Matthew Fuller is factored into that 87. Matthew Fuller, of course, is not on campus yet, but he will be this fall. Before we wrap things up, let's hit a couple ads, and then we will answer some final questions on the other side of things, and we'll Get everyone on their way. But today's show, as it always is, brought to you by our good friends over at Liberty Tax. Tax season is right around the corner. If you're like me, you're trying to get everything in order to make things much easier this tax season. So you can overcome tax anxiety. Give the folks over at Liberty Tax a call, and they can be able to help you do just that this tax season. That number is 803 462 Five five seven six. And today's show is also brought to you by our good friend Clint Hammond of Movement Mortgage. If you're in the process of purchasing a home, trying to find the lowest rate on the market, Clint and his team can be able to help you out. If you've been trying to buy a home, or you've been looking at homes over the last two years, you know those rates have been absolutely insane. Well, Clint and his team can help you try to make that process much easier for you the same way 
they were able to do for our very own Wes Mitchell and former Gamecock quarterback and captain Perry Orth. Give Quinn a call at 803-771-6933. All right, final thoughts. Let us know what you got before we wrap things up. Austin, Alfred asks, do you think Nick Harbor still needs to figure out route running? I don't know how much it is. I mean, from a route running standpoint, I think it can't hurt because he's still so young. I think he's smart enough to be able to pick up, okay, you know, there's only so many routes that you can run. I think more than anything, it's being able to understand route concepts as far as what his responsibilities are and the guy next to him and truly understanding why he's running certain routes and understanding um, what they're trying to accomplish from an offensive standpoint, not just, a, okay, this is what my route and my responsibility is. And I think you see that from a lot of young wide receivers. I mean, certainly someone that is making the jump still after playing tight end in high school to being able to move over to wide receiver last year. I think that's one thing that he'll continue to improve on. But I think the other thing too is, is just simply just improving as a pass catcher. And we've talked about this going back to even last year. One of the biggest things that Nick struggled with from a consistency standpoint was just catching the football. I know that there was a lot of people that wanted to see Nick Harbour out there a little bit earlier in his career, playing a little bit more. And we certainly got to see more and more of him as the season went on. But a lot of it had to do with just consistency. And that's not anything that I would say should be a red flag or make people worry. But again, you had a guy that was making the move over from being a tight end to a wide receiver. He was a five-star athlete, not a five-star wide receiver. He was a five-star athlete. We have to constantly remind people that, that there was going to be some type of growing pains. So I think with Harbor, what we see from him this year, and I've said this before, I don't think he's there yet to be the number one wide receiver. For those of you that get caught up with, okay, who's the number one, who's the number two, who's the number three, I certainly think he can make a push to be the number two guy. You have experience now with some of the players that you brought in from the transfer portal. I think Jared Brown is one of those players that could be the number one for South Carolina. You look at his height, though, and I know some would be like, well, I'd like to see my wide receiver be a little bit, a little bit taller. I get that. But at the same time, too, if we learned anything from this past season with Dow Loggins, it's that you have to be able to play multiple spots out there. You have to be able to play in the perimeter. You have to be able to play in the slot. If you're someone that can get the job done, it really doesn't matter where they're going to line you up. They'll line you up anywhere. And on the flip side of that, can help you from a draft standpoint. Go look at what Xavier Leggett is going to be doing this week at the NFL Combine. Be sure to pay attention to that. As I believe it's tomorrow, I believe it's tomorrow, you're going to see Harbor and not Harbor, excuse me, as I see Harbor's name pop up again in the comment section. You're going to see Xavier Leggett and Rattler at it as they take to the field for their testing portion of the combine. Double check that for you guys right now. So Saturday. Saturday is when wide receivers, quarterbacks, and running backs will be on the field working out tomorrow tomorrow you have defensive backs and tight ends so that will leave train Trey Knox Trey Knox will be in action tomorrow and then on Sunday you'll have a chance to be able to check out Nick Gargiulo so that's where Things are at right now for South Carolina. Five players, five players, defensive backs today also. So Marcellus Dial will also be in action at the NFL Combine. What else we got here? God Loves Comics says, if teams stack the box to stop Rocket and Lenores from running, it could really open up opportunities for Nick down the field. Last season, he was very raw, and there was little running threat i think i think you'll see we've mentioned this before on, on other shows 
I think if you're South Carolina, I think what we'll see is we'll see them be a team that is more run heavy, run oriented in comparison to what they were last year. Now, having said that, obviously you need to be a team that's not getting your doors kicked in. And I'm not saying that South Carolina is going to be getting their doors kicked in, but if you're a team that's playing from behind, you're only going to be able to run the ball so much. I mean, even the the armies, the air forces of the world, the teams that run the triple option, the wishbone, even though they run the football so much, if they're getting blown out, and obviously Air Force wasn't really getting blown out this year that much, the way that they were playing, they had a phenomenal season. But you're going to have to throw the football at some point. So I think with South Carolina, I think, you know, obviously RPO has become something that has took on a life of its own, really. But it doesn't even have to necessarily be an RPO. Um, it could just be, you know, it could be a traditional option. It could be a, a triple option. Um, I think we're going to see Sellers take advantage of what he's able to bring to the table. And that's someone that can beat you through the air, and he can also beat you with with his feet. But like we mentioned before, from a wide receiver standpoint, you need to be able to create separation. I think we're going to see a lot of quick passes, slants, screens, short routes. And then if it's going back to what God Loves Comics mentioned before, if teams are going to sneak up an extra guy into the box, bring down a, a safety and put him in the box, what that's going to do is that's going to create another opportunity to be able to win one-on-ones over the top. And that could be a guy like, like Harbor or a guy like even like Jared Brown. So it's going to be a cat and mouse game for sure. When we look at what South Carolina is able to do from a uh, schematic standpoint, especially with the talent they have in the running back room, but also with the speed that they have with Lenore's sellers. Lynn says pick and tech. Hate week. Go yard Cox. Game Cox Clemson. Begin the series tomorrow. Justin Hill, what you think of Spencer's decision to throw in the combine? I like it, Justin. I really do. Because to me, and I know that for those of you who don't pay attention to the combine as much, maybe other than a couple weeks of the of the year, Rattler, despite the fact that he had a really strong showing at the senior bowl, not just in the game, but more importantly, the practice week itself out of Mobile, he's still one of the quarterbacks that is going to be probably drafted later than I think a lot of Gamecock fans would expect him to be drafted. I don't think he's a first-round pick. I don't think he's a second-round pick. I think if he does some really good things this week, could he sneak in possibly late in the second? Maybe. But I think he's going to be a, a day-three guy. Excuse me, a day two guy, third round, late day two, early day three. Early day three, we put him in the fourth round, but I think he can sneak up into the third round and be a day two guy. I think the thing with Rattler is when you look at some of these other quarterbacks that they're talking about, no one's going to draft Rattler with the mindset, okay, we're going to build our franchise around him, and that's all right. And honestly, to me, for Rattler, outside of the fact of, okay, you get drafted higher, you're going to get more money, more guaranteed money. If I'm Rattler, that's perfect. Go into a situation where the expectations aren't as high for him. He's going to be able to go out there, earn a number two job, and then, as I mentioned on 107.5 The Game earlier this week, if you go back to this past season, at some point, whether it be coaches' decisions, whether it be someone getting hurt, every backup played at least one snap last year in the NFL. So I bring that up to say if if Rattler is in a good situation somewhere, and I think just because of his experience of working with an NFL offensive coordinator like Dal Loggins, I think he's going to impress, and we're going to hear more throughout the week, but I think he's really going to impress scouts when he's in front of them on the whiteboard um, but you add all that in with the fact that a lot of these quarterbacks ahead of them, and I say ahead of them, quarterbacks that are projected to be drafted ahead of them, are deciding not to throw. And I get it because you want to throw with your guys. You do have Xavier Leggett there. You do have Xavier there. But you're also going to be throwing to a lot of wide receivers who, from a timing standpoint, it's it's going to be a little bit off. 
simply because they're not your wide receivers. That's why a lot of these quarterbacks decide to throw a pro day at their own pro day with their wide receivers. So the timing's there. But if you're a Rattler, what do you have to lose? Really? If you're already not projected to be where the Caleb Williams, the Drake Mays, even the Bo Nix, if you're not projected to be drafted higher than these guys, why not go out there and literally let it rip? So I love the idea that Rattler and his camp are, are deciding to do this. And you know what? Worst case, okay, things, let's say, God forbid, things don't go well. He gets to come back at pro day and he can throw here. Um, but if he does well, guess what? He becomes a story now for the rest of the week because he was the one that decided to throw. So we saw how things played out for him at the Senior Bowl and how quickly he was the story. If he does some of those things that he did out in Mobile, you watch how quickly he'll become the story again. And as I mentioned, being a guy that goes from, okay, late day two, which is the third round, to being potentially a guy that can sneak up into the second round, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. So we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. Justin Hill adds, excited to see how Rattler can show off. Yep. Big Red, we're hearing a lot about the offensive side of the ball. The defense is a part that truly concerns me. Hopefully we fix some of the issues there. Big Red, we've talked about it a couple of times this offseason. We'll talk more about it next week. We'll do that. We'll start to really get into the defensive side because I'm sure you're not alone in wanting to hear more about the defensive side. What I really like about the defense, though, is when you look at the defensive tackle position and the edge position, those two positions in particular, South Carolina has a lot of proven depth, a lot of proven depth. And I think what you're going to notice, even going back to the second level at the linebacking position, what South Carolina is going to be able to do is they're really going to be able to rotate more. They're going to have fresher legs. That was something I felt like really hurt them last year. And it was evident once we got into games later. I mean, you saw the number of snaps some of these players are playing. God bless Debo uh, Williams. God bless, and I know he's not here on the team anymore, but Stone Blanton. I mean, some of these guys were playing so many freaking snaps. Obviously, that was the case at the defensive back, too. But because of that, especially the defensive tackle, the edge position, not being able to rotate as many guys in, they weren't putting the pressure on. And that's why South Carolina, for the majority of the season, they really struggled with creating not just sacks, but tackles for a loss just in general. And as I said many times last season, I don't care who the hell is in your secondary. You know, you can put DJ Swearinger back there. You can put JC Horn. You can put Stephon Gilmore, uh, Captain Munderland. I don't care who the hell's back there. It doesn't matter. If you're not putting pressure on the quarterback, if you're not being able to create tackles for a loss, the guys in the secondary are only going to be able to do so much. So I think this year, more than anything, being able – to have fresher legs, I think that's one thing in particular that South Carolina is really going to be able to point to and say, all right, hey, we can do a little bit more this year. And some of the competition that we're going to see at the edge position, at D-tackle, there's going to be some good competition, really good competition. I mentioned this, I think, maybe on Tuesday, maybe even may have been last Thursday, that – there's been some nice pickups via the transfer portal. There's also been, of course, the addition of Dylan Stewart. But one player in particular who I feel like is really getting overlooked this offseason, like we're just not hearing that much about him because everyone's so excited about other players, is Desmond Umio Zulu, a guy that played in all 12 games last year. So I bring that up just as an example to say that there's a lot of talent in that edge room in particular. It's also a lot of talent in the defensive tackle position, but I think we're really going to start to see South Carolina take advantage of having that depth and having that talent that they just didn't have last year. They just didn't have last year. So that's what I would say about that. If you missed any of our show today, head on over to the Gamecock Central YouTube page, and you can watch this show in its entirety for free 
or if you're a podcast listener, head on over to the Gamecock Central Podcast Network, where you can also subscribe for free today. And if you're not a Gamecock Central subscriber, why not sign up today for just $1 for the first month? Get all your Gamecock football information, as well as basketball, baseball, and everything else in between. Appreciate everyone that tuned in today. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, and enjoy your weekend. Gamecock baseball in action, taking on Clemson. And, of course, basketball will be in action this week, too. You can get it all your information over on Gamecock Central. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, folks.